Hi everyone, it's Kelly with Women For One and I am so honored to be here today with Tosha Silver. Um, I was introduced to Tosha Silver by Dr. Christian Northup who said on our interview, you have to speak to Tosha Silver. She's an amazing soul beautiful, lighthearted, and I wholeheartedly agree. I, After reading Tosha's book, Outrageous Openness, Letting the Divine Take the Lead, I feel like she's a kindred spirit of mine, and I cannot wait to have this authentic conversation about women, power, authenticity, God, spirituality, and just life in general, because I, I one of my favorite things about um, Tosha is that she's a self-described spiritual prag pragmatist, and I've never been able to describe myself. But if I if I had to, I would I would say that as well. Tosha um, grew up in Pennsylvania, and she has a degree from Yale in English literature. She spent many many years giving over thirty thousand I can't even imagine that astrological readings, which. By the way, she's on hiatus from now. <laughs> and currently she's a columnist for the San Francisco Spiritual Examiner and the author of, as I said, an incredibly light, down to earth, but deeply rooted in spiritual principles book, Outrageous Openness, Letting the Divine Take the Lead. Um, so I just wanna welcome you, Tosha, and I'm really excited about having this conversation. Hi, Tosha, it's Kelly McNeilis. Hello, good morning. It's really wonderful that I'm speaking with you because I feel so aligned with all the principles that you so pragmatically explained in your book. My whole life has been about really aligning and leading with the divine and really aligning with that divine principle. And through Women for One, that's how it came about. If the goal really is that the divine guides it, it has nothing to do with passivity. Is zero. So, you know, people will often set up this false paradox and they'll say, well, you either, you know, go to a coach and get some 40 ridiculous rules about how this <laughs> has to happen, or you do nothing and you just lay on the couch and, you know, watch Oprah and, and hope something occurs. And it's neither of that because once the actions are really offered to the divine in a genuine way, the actions start arising spontaneously and you know exactly what to do. Absolutely. And that's that's what that's what really I hear you saying. That's beautiful because for one, it, and, it, and it's you know because the divine is so creative and expressive and even idiosyncratic. It's never this rule book of like everybody needs a book or <laughs> you know it's that God's not that stupid. It's like it's so different for each person. And I, I know the, the interesting thing, what I find is so beautiful about being a conduit, truly, for this movement that's happening. It's not me, and I'm very yeah. clear that it's not me. Being that conduit is the mystery of it. It's kind of like yeah. being in a novel. <laughs> it's kind of like sitting there and going, wow, I wonder what's going to happen next. Because when I reach out to these big people, it, w whatever the society terms as big people, you know, success, quote, in quotes, I, I people are like, well, how are you getting these people to speak with you? And I'm like, I'm asking them. <laughs> I, it, well, it's, and, it's and the you know. Is, it's, also, it's also really because, you know, in the end, we're all just energy. Yes. So there's no people that are big or small. That's kind of right. And, and so if somebody has karma, helping you. Right. They simply will. And, and I remember that was happening also when when I was first writing the book. Um, and people uh, were reaching, you, you know, because I, I just think there's so much embedded in the culture about how you should, you know, air quotes, do things. And often those shoulds, they leave out the incredible divine creativity of how things can happen in very unexpected ways. And so exactly the same as you're saying, you know, people were like, mm -hmm. well, you know, you really have to line yourself up with, with a lot of the right people and you have to do this and you have to do that. And really I did nothing against <laughs> writing and kind of ignored almost everything people said, including the fact that they said, and you have to position the book in the, I mean, I didn't write it because people were telling me to, I, I am a writer, and, and that was the logical thing to do. Right. But once it was coming together, then it was like, you have to position that book because you basically only have six months to make a splash, and then after that, you're just lost at the bottom of the sea. And I and I remember, you know, talking to somebody saying, 
why on earth would I want to believe that if I'm writing a book about aligning with the divine, that every single person who needs to read this book is going to be mysteriously drawn to it, and they're all going to find it. Right. In a sense, you know, I never advertised in the typical ways. I never, you know, I just did it just as we're talking about. I really said the same way I would have from... I kind of took all the advice that was an outrageous openness, and I and I live it. It's, like it's not a construct to me, and so I just said, the perfect people who all need to hear about this book will hear, and the perfect people who need to read it will read it, and that's simply the way it's going to go. And I don't have to go jump through a lot of hoops that feel uncomfortable, Absolutely. feel wrong, and and that that's how I think you know. Just just like you're talking about with the instinct, the 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 things that feel right. You know right away, like when you reached me, even though my mind was going, um, I don't know if they, do these people really know what this book is about? Is this going to be a harmony with them? But they kept saying, oh, no, 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 talk to them. <laughs> because I didn't even know if you'd read the book yet. Yeah, no, and I had not read the book, but I, I interviewed Dr. Northup and had such a fabulous interview with her. Um, yeah. And all she did was say, you've got to talk to Tosha. <laughs> And so, you know, I listen when the universe tells me something. So I reached out to you, and then I read your book and got connected. Well, and she's a perfect example, because all that time when people were saying, you, you, you have to go position yourself with the right people, you have to go align yourself with people that make audiences, you know, again, a lot of that comes from the doership of the ego and the idea, even the idea... I like what you said earlier when you kind of were saying, well, this, this, this organization, you're obviously the one the universe is using to guide it, but it doesn't belong to you. It belongs to something bigger. And it's because you're genuinely in that knowledge and it's not just a concept, but you're really saying this doesn't belong to you, then all these things can happen. And so the same thing happened with the book. I thought, look, once this comes through me, this doesn't belong to me. I'm going to guide it, I'm going to do what my instincts say, but the right people who need to help will help. And the, Dr. Neutrop was exactly like that. I mean, she just kind of came out of the sky, really. Right. Um, and, and just sort of said, wow, this is telling me everything that I've been trying to get from all these other places, and here it all is contained in this in this volume. But it you know, wasn't because somebody said, well, here's a good person for you to go harangue until she reached she supports you. She just came on her own. Right. So I think a lot of it happens on so many levels that you're you're getting out of the way, but you're calling in you're calling in the support. So it's not passive. You're saying, okay, God, if this is your your if this is your will, that's a that's a prayer I'll use a lot. Like I'll say, if this is your will, then let the doors open so that whoever can be helped by this be helped. But if it's not your will, I'll do this part a lot. I don't know if you ever do this. I'll say particular issue coming up, if it's not your will, please release me from it. Oh, yes. Yes. And I will, because I think that's the piece that's so often left out by people. You know, we write on Facebook every day, and people will say things like, well, I have this desire, and then they're doing, you know, the, the vision board, and the writing, and the writing, oh, I want this, I want <laughs> this, bring it, bring it. And I'm like going, but what would happen if you just took the desire, there's nothing wrong with desire, sometimes they are rising from God. And they're God's desire for you, so you at least offer it over. And you're saying, okay, if this is your desire, and this can be of use, then you'll then please show me the steps and open the doors in the way they need to. But if it's not, then oh my God, just free me from this. Right. So that what you want to happen can happen because you know every one of us knows desires that are not meant to manifest. And if you go down this road and you're like, oh, what a nightmare! It's only I, my ego hadn't taken control of that and tried to make it happen. Absolutely. Absolutely. And when you speak about um, that action, it is it is action. I know Dr. Northup and I have, spoke, uh, have spoken a lot about the feminine and the masculine, and that has been a theme throughout a lot of my interviews with people. Um, yeah. And 
I love your phrase, and also Dr. Northup spoke about this, so I want to go into this, around yeah. the feminine, the masculine, and the ease and the effortlessness and the power of the feminine principle or whatever you would want to name it or phrase it. And I just wanted to ask you to speak about that, how yeah, that can be so powerful. That's a great question. Well, you know, I think for me there's a couple layers to that because I, I think we are all both. And I don't think of the feminine and the masculine as, as being related to gender. So I think we, we both, we, all people contain both senses in them, but that we live in a culture and I probably say that also as an astrologer, because, you know, I, I used to give readings as an astrologer for 30 years, and every chart has some masculinity and some femininity in it, and that if you think of the, the masculine as that sort of forceful, go get it, go do it, make it happen energy mm-hmm. that dominates culture so intensely, and then if you think of the feminine as that receptive, we all have both, but because it's so completely over fixated in this culture on the the do it do it part Mm -hmm. the the feminine gets neglected and and i think that it kind of wasn't an accident that there's a a goddess on the cover of outrageous openness because i think in general like many people do that that there's this reawakening of that feminine energy although i often it's really funny because i'm glad you're asking about it because i often also get um, almost concerned about the way the feminine gets represented as if it's only this yin passivity. And, right. And, you know, as somebody, you know, who loves Durga, you know, the Indian goddess who rides on the tiger, and I love Kali, who's the slayer of demons, yes. and I, you know, but I also love Mother Mary and Kuan Yin, and I love all these forms of the, of the feminine divine and, and the masculine divine, but mm-hmm. it's, it, but, it's not only that passivity and that receiving, but I think here's here's how I see it in terms of the mix of the feminine and the masculine is that is that the indi- people so often were coming to me when from the book and saying, you know, how do I make this happen or how do I make that happen? And that's how the divine gets left out. And the feminine part to me is the invitation. That's why I probably Dr. Northrop was talking to you about the change me prayers I do. Mm-hmm. Because to me, there's this really deep feminine essence to that, in that you're inviting in the divine mm-hmm. and you're saying, let's say, you know, I, I did a lot of them about uh, courage at one point. And so it was like saying, rather than doing an affirmation that just says, I am a courageous person, which has its merits, it, it can make you feel more courageous if the subconscious absorbs that. But it's quite different when you need courage for an event or for your life to say to the divine, beloved, change me into somebody who has courage. Transform me into somebody who has courage. And by doing that, you're opening the space of receiving, which is to me that that, that feminine essence right of, of, of rather than oh, i'm going to go make myself you're saying change me into somebody who can do this and it's it's incredibly incredibly powerful as a prayer and i use them in fact i'm going to come out with a book of change me prayers this year uh, i'm working on it because it's it, so different than how we're taught to think about it including even the idea of um effort because People will do things like they'll say, they'll write it, you know, they'll write to me and they'll say, you know, it's a lot of work to align with the divine. It's a lot of work. And I'll go, that's really that masculine fixation on it's work, it's effort, make it happen. When in fact, as soon as you're saying, I'm letting, I'm allowing, I'm receiving, I'm inviting the change, I'm making room for it, then when the right actions get shown, you know, I have a really kick-ass side to me that has a lot of fire in my chart, but it's very different because that part, which I guess you could say is the masculine side, comes forward once the actions get shown by the divine. Right. And it's very different than efforting. Yes, having that effort, that linear kind of do, 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 instead of the receiving. It's that the action arises, right? And Mm -hmm. then it's 
coming because you created the space and you said to the divine, come in, change me, do what you wish, let this unfold the way you wish, then when the action comes, you're like, wham, go for it. But it's not the doership. And I think one way you can also tell if you don't have the doership is you don't care what happens. Right. You don't have that attachment. Right. And you don't. Attachment, you don't. You just don't. You're like, okay, I'm taking all the actions that the line's showing me. If it's meant to fly, it's going to fly. If it doesn't, it's because she has a better plan. A better plan. Right. Absolutely. And but with that feminine, I mean, I totally agree with everything you're saying. I'm curious how we allow for it. Like, you talk about it in your book, which I will do, obviously, an intro later for this. But, um, because <laughs> we just got yeah, to no, talking and it's, like, it's, like, what? What are they talking it's about? so juicy that I'll just do the intro after we're off the phone and they'll edit it in and they'll edit this out. Um, but I, I wanted to say, with your book, you, you speak about that receiving, and I, I learned several years ago um, about the receiving feminine, and how, you know, you speak so beautifully, I, I, first of all, I love that you're, you call yourself a spiritual pragmatist, I read that in the book, because I've always felt that way, I've been on a spiritual path, or whatever you want to call it, for my whole life, and yeah. I'm in this place now of, it doesn't have to be all love and light, it can, the Spiritual principles can be grounded into your daily life and woven into anything you do. And that's why I feel so aligned with what you're doing is because yeah. that's how we're going to actually really allow for that to come through to everyone in the world. So with that, when you talk about the receiving and the giving, I learned several years ago that that receiving is just as powerful as the giving. And I don't know if you can talk a little bit about that in your book, yeah. Outrageous Openness. I know it's, it's funny timing because I'm in the middle of, of teaching a five week class on opening to receiving. Mm, right. Um, I do, I, you know, I do like uh, telephone and online classes. And it's, it's really, in fact, you, you might find it interesting. There's, a, there's a, some MP3s on, on my website, you know, on toshasilver.com that are about balancing giving and receiving. Okay. Because it's such a huge topic. So I ended up, uh, you know, when it's back in the years of giving the readings, especially with women, there was so much about give, give, give mm -hmm. without any real uh, focus on knowing that they deserve to receive. And, and that was when I made the, the, the empty threes that are on there. But you're you're hundred percent right because it's it's the flow and that so much of I, what happens I think is that you're where the energy is only fixated on giving and the receiving is neglected, not only do you burn out and that's a huge factor, you you just eventually run to zero because too much is going on and not enough is coming in. But also, you know, vibrationally, you start to attract all these people around you who see you only as a giver. Right. Excuse me. And then I'm sure, you know, it's almost like so many people have this experience. And, you know, it's kind of like you're putting out the buffet table every day, but they're like, what, only 20 dishes? Why not 30 dishes? It isn't like <laughs> people are really grateful for what you're doing because you're only in the you're only in the mode of giving. And and I think it's it's funny, I don't know if it comes in part after the whole Christian thing of like it's better to give than receive. Right. But I think a lot of people have tremendous misunderstanding about it because it's really just the yin and yang. It's the yin and yang. Are. But I guess, you know, with with a lot of women especially that I know and that I've seen in, in our society, particularly, you know, I did it in my twenties and thirties. I gave, gave, gave. I I, yeah. I got addicted to the idealized image of being the perfect wife and the perfect mother and then it exploded in my face <laughs> and <clears throat> and so how can can you describe what kind of power comes from actually receiving yeah well i think part of it i mean a lot of the core of receiving <clears throat> is really worthiness mm -hmm. you know it's that's how i see it is that you have to feel worthy in order to receive anything and that a lot of the reasons why we're taught a lot of times when people are full-time givers, which, you know, I did I had a different route than you, but I did. My 20s were that. And I did it in my business. I, I, I just worked day and night and day and night. And then in the end, I had adrenal failure. I write about it in the book. Right. And, and then, I, you know, I realized how absolutely um, inconsequential it really was. It was one of the best things that could have happened because I've been giving day and night, and suddenly... 
doesn't work anymore and everybody just found someone else to go to and you went, wow, how liberating. Mm-hmm. You don't actually have to give day and night and get sick because really, if you learn how to receive, you actually start to become a full circuit inside of yourself. But I, I think that the way, the way to learn it is partly through the change prayers, you know, given, given how I look at all this stuff, and I'm doing a lot of this in the class I'm teaching now, where, you know, we're just doing change me prayers that, that say things like, change me into somebody who feels worthy to receive. Right. And change me into <clears throat> somebody who knows my own value. Because so often, that's the core of it, isn't it? It's like this idea that, that you know, it can look sometimes as if the endless giving is selfless. But and sometimes it is. But sometimes it's also saying, you know, let me prove that I'm good enough. Yes. Let me prove that I'm worthy of love. And you don't even right? know that you're doing that. You, you know, don't even you know don't, that you're doing you don't it. even so know it. It's so subconscious. Mm-hmm. But so often, especially for so many women, that's the core of it. It's like, if I only just give this much, if I keep giving, I keep giving, then you won't leave. Then, then you'll love me. Then it'll work. When in fact, this is the irony, often when you overgive, it doesn't work out. And, right. and then the person leaves, and you're furious. Right. Right? Because yeah. under the bottom of it, it's like after, you know, it's that classic Jewish line, I can say that. Jewish, <laughs> you know, after all I did for you, why isn't this working? And you don't have to do any of that nope. when you're inside the circuit of giving and receiving. But I do think it, it, it's almost like grace that comes from the divine. At least it was for me. There was no amount of therapy to learn this. It, for me, it was really when I started saying to the divine, let me know my own value. Right. Let me know what I deserve to receive. That's beautiful. That's, yeah, that's, it's interesting you talk about that because moving into the term surrender is a big one for me. And I, in my early 20s, I couldn't find a job out of college and I was looking, my father had died when I was 18 and I was really in that searching mode. Um, and I wrote a letter to my guru at that time and it had three words on it. What is surrender? And I, (laughs) and, and she said, come live with me in India. So I did. (laughs) And, um, but, but from that, it's been a theme my whole life to really understand the, the term surrender and allowing for. So yeah. w- when you were talking about your change me prayers, you know, and how, and then we also spoke about how you don't align with the whole push, push manifestation with these prayers. Is there an element after the prayers of allowing for and surrendering to what will be? And if you could talk about that. Yeah, that's a good question, too. I think it's implicit. You know, in a way, this was a conversation that, that was happening on, on Facebook when I was starting to first print the Change Me Prayers a lot, is that kind of crazy all this has gone on on Facebook. You know, people people keep going, God, I just go on Facebook and hear people complaining about the weather or their ex or something, and while you're writing about all this stuff, I don't know how it all ended up there, but the... Um, People would say, some people would say, I don't want to do change me prayers. I'm fine if I am. It, it seems as if you're saying, I'm not good as I am. Please change me into somebody who's good. And that's not how I see it. I right. think they're, the core of the change me prayer is surrender, just like you're saying. Mm-hmm. It's, the, it's the ego mind surrendering to the wisdom of the soul. Oh, that was beautiful. <laughs> and that's really how I see it, is that... Is that the, you know? It's not even an external thought or an external anything. It's it's inside the God inside, really having the wisdom, having the knowledge, and the change me. Is, the prayer itself is really saying, change this limited ego mind into something that can absorb and follow the wisdom of the highest. That's in, you know that that knows, and and so implicit in that is a surrender because as soon as you're saying, you know, even, and it's very funny because a really good changing prayer has changed me into somebody who can let go. Mm-hmm. Because it's true that the ego mind, it's so tricky and subtle, it'll say, yeah, 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 you've let go, but here's really the secret agenda that you have underneath here. So there's no problem with any of that. That's how we're all trained to think, except that any time there's that, attachment or, you know, 
I'm trying to manipulate the situation to get this or that, that's the moment when you can go back to a change me prayer and say, okay, change me into somebody who can really let go. It's uh, really about, yes, somebody you can really surrender. and about getting that awareness that you feel it in that moment that you have a tool that you can use. Yes. And even then you can say, change me to somebody who every day has more of that awareness. It's really great because every, it's like a, it's like a roundabout in traffic where every road goes back to this place where everything we're taught is to keep thinking our egos are going to be able to do this. <laughs> and they, you know, every, I love Ajashanti. I don't know if you're familiar with yes. him. He's, a, mm-hmm. he's a Zen teacher and I just mm-hmm. love him so much. And, and he'll, he'll often say stuff like, you know, you just have to know your mind isn't going to know how to do this. Right. Because the mind is, it's, it's, it's useless. And so, you know, my version of that, because I guess by nature I'm so devotional and and, and kind of, you know, it's in India, really the bhakti nature of being in love with God nature. I'm like, yeah, the mind can't do it. And for me, just knowing my mind can't do it wasn't going to take me very far because I kind of need something to be in love with, like the divine. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Right. So it, it was helpful to go, yeah, the mind can't do it, but then I'm like, well, now what? Now what am I left with? I can't just be in the void. But when you're when you're passionate and devotional by nature, the void isn't enough. Right. So for me, falling in love with God is plenty. I will keep my hands full. You know? Yeah. So that's how the change me prayers came out, because then you're going, all right, take me over. Take me over. That's that's something I can I can go with. It's beautiful. You know, I don't it's a need surrender. Any desire. You take them over. You bring what you want. So I think for people that have that nature. This is very, very exciting work. It is exciting. And it, in, in your book, you speak about um, uh, sharing your story. And you said, I just want to quote you really quickly yeah. if, um, because it's so beautiful what you said. And and I always, when I interview people, the first thing I do is I, tr- I, I look for that place where the, my heart opens when I read something they say. And I mean, yeah. your book was like so much of it, but this one hit me and... And because we ask women to share, for a better word, their stories or their experiences and their wisdom, um, you said you quoted and said, "Well, what if God is the story?" And you so eloquently say, "So what if the high ex- highest expression of the personal divine is you, precisely as you are in this mo- this very moment, in all your full, authentic, and wounded glory?" And I literally tear up when I read that. And so it's just. It moved me because of the authenticity and and the word wounded really is like, what if we just can self accept that this is it right here? We are the divine. And I just want to thank you for that. I'm like, (laughs) it really opens my heart every time I read that. Uh, thank you. Thank you for reading that. And, and I mean, thank you for for really getting it because I can hear your voice that you do. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that quote personally means a lot to me too because um, as I, you know, my background was I, I was on a variety of different paths at different points in my 20s and 30s and part of my 40s and what was happening not to say there wasn't value in all of that but there was this I would almost say fanciful idea of this perfected spiritual being that all these people were striving for. <laughs> and that you're going to get to this weird space where, like, you're always joyous and, you know, you never have acne or, oh, who knows what they were thinking, you know, you never, you never have a craving for a latte. I mean, I don't know what craziness, but it was like... Perfectly like, enlightened, yes. Perfectly, yeah, and just it, enlightened. And, and I consider it now Disneyland spirituality. <laughs> I guess what I call it. It's just like, let's go to Disneyland and run on the ride. And and what was always coming, because during that time I was also getting the astrology readings, is that I was reading, I was giving readings to, to many of these people, so many of whom were so beautiful mm-hmm. and lovely and tortured, because they were calling me and they were like, I'm trying so hard, <laughs> I still can't get to that perfection. And, oh. and you know, it so, was so poignant. And, mm-hmm. and, it was probably, you know, the experiences that, again, were feeding kind of the teeth that would end up in the book because all that kept happening for me 
And of course, I was in my own process too, of going, wait a minute, this is about really embracing the divine as you are right now, not in some Mickey Mouse pretend place of where it's going to be in some perfect day, that it's, it's right now. And, and what I was finding too was, you, meant, you alluded to this earlier and I wanted to come back to it, that that whole idea that spirituality is over here, that it's just love and light and, oh. you know, <laughs> dancing around in rainbows, but that there's nothing spiritual about the, the dark stuff. And I, I don't even consider anything dark anymore, but that, you know, to me, having this, you know, sitting in my mother's bed while she was dying last July was, you know, probably the most spiritual experience, one of the most spiritual experiences of my life. And if you, you know, read the book, shopping at Ross Dress for Less and, you know, having to find a cheap dress really fast, it's a very spiritual yes. experience. When you, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> because anything spiritual, as soon as the divine is invited, that, that to me is the part of all of this. It's like, it's so sad in a way that there's this idea that the things that are spiritual are just, you know, the dancing angels or something. It's all spiritual as soon as God's invited and God's always there. Mm-hmm. And whether the awareness is inviting that energy in is what makes it spiritual. So sometimes these really dark and horrible, seemingly horrible things can become amazingly spiritual as soon as the divine is included in, which was really the point of the book. It was like, as soon as that invitation is made, any experience becomes spiritual and then the help is there. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, when you, when you talk about that, um, I did want to go into losing your mother because I, I listened to one of your interviews and you, and you spoke about that um, experience. And I had a very similar experience to you um, with my dearest friend six years ago who passed. And I, uh, three months, she had three little children and she had liver cancer. And when she was diagnosed terminal, she could have gone in and fought and you know really looked into all the different medications and she got really clear and heard it was her time to go and and she asked me she said i don't know anybody else that can hold that space with me for the next 100 days that i'm probably going to be alive but can you hold that with me to the best of your you know ability and so that was my intent for 100 days to hold the space of that is what she needed to do it was it was her time and it was it it changed me the experience of 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 holding a space for another human being in in in, with no agenda for a hundred days it changed me forever it 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 deepened every spiritual cell in my body it deepened my love for anything and i could never i I love hearing your story about how joyous you were when she was free because i had the exact same experience i sat there i was so happy she was she had gone i was dancing i was dancing No, it, I, oh God, it's, it's so great to talk about it because I think there's so much misunderstanding about it. I mean, it's understandable because everything in the culture is saying cling on to that person, you know, cling to life at all costs or cling on to that person. And in a way, it's a very selfish agenda. Yes. And, you know, even though I don't think people do it intentionally to be selfish, they're saying, I need to keep you here. I need you. I need this. I need that. And they'll even do it with animals. You know, it's like those the animals are so devoted to us and, you know, pets. And, and if you say to an animal who's sick, like, don't leave me, don't leave me, they'll often suffer so hugely to stay there whereas like you're saying if you're really that to me is the greatest gift you can give another being well really one of the greatest gifts you can give is to just say do what you need and mm-hmm. I will support you mm-hmm. and, and and especially when you know you're at that store that, that is kind of what was going on with my mom is is I felt like the, the best thing I could give her because she was such an amazing mom was to, was to say, you've done such a great job. Like, you've been the best mother I could imagine. Now, please be free of this cage of this body mm-hmm. and go and go. And 
what was funny, well, there were two things also with that, was that my dad, they, you know, they, they'd been married 64 years, and, or 65, I forget, so wow. he died three months later, mm-hmm. and again, you know, people were coming up at the funeral, and they're like, I'm so sorry for your tragedy, I'm so sorry for, you know, you're an orphan now, I mean, they're, you know, they're saying all kinds <laughs> of stuff, and I was just sitting there like, oh my God. What I'm reality so are you in? When he went, <laughs> When she died, the first thing he did is he turned to me and he just said, this woman is taking care of everything in my life. I don't, I don't want to live without her. I just want to follow her. <laughs> and so I felt, you know, when, they, when I got the call that said only three months later he had passed, I was like, thank God, you know, now they're together. And she probably said, hey, give me, let me rest for three months before you come. So, <laughs> but, you know, but, but that feeling, it was so different. So, you know, when, and, and certainly the idea of being an orphan, when you know that God's your parent. And, and, and you wrote about that in your outrageous yeah, openness. I really feel first... that in my heart. That wasn't just a good line. I mean, right. I would not know when people would say that. I would just be like, but God's the parent, God's the lover, God's all of that. How on earth? Could I be an orphan now? The one that brought my parents or any of our parents to begin with is the divine. So that was just the form that the divine used, which doesn't mean I don't, especially my mom, I was just insanely close to her. And every day there's something I wish I could call and tell her. But one day I was crying in the car and I was crying, missing her and wishing to tell her something. And I heard her just say, clear as day, I am in the next seat. Why on earth couldn't you just tell me? <laughs> you know, and she's very, she's very acerbic and very, very, very funny sense of humor. I just started laughing because it was exactly how she would talk. Oh, you know, she'd I, be like, I love it. Enough already. I'm in the next. And that's Jules. Jules was like that. She was like, oh, honey. Like, I hear her sometimes. I'm like, really? Really, Jules? Like, I'll have these out, uh, full out conversations with her about what I yeah. need to be doing. And she'll, I'll hear her giggle, like when she's playing a joke on me. And yeah. it's, it's great. It feels very clear that they're, yeah. they're still around. <laughs> yeah. And you can tap into that at any point. Yeah. Isn't that it's so fabulous? It's, it's great it's, to talk about it. It's a beautiful thing, and I, I really would love um, to have further conversations. Um, Dr. Jill Bolte Taylor and I had a very similar conversation about her. Um, a friend of hers that passed, a very, very dear friend. And we have been talking about eventually really having a conversation with several people about how to really shift that place. Uh, that would be wonderful. I mean, it really, it's really, it's so close to my heart after a year where we're both parents of transition. And, and I got, you know, I ended up writing about it nonstop on Facebook, which was, which was funny, but because I was getting my own healing from all these beautiful people, amazing people that were writing it all over the world. And, you know, for the first time, they were getting a different way to look at it. Uh, you know, they yeah. were parents, they were, and they were like, you know, coming from that place of, oh, they're gone, and so sorry for your loss. And all of a sudden, they were like, what if they're not gone? And what if, you know, I, I did help liberate them just by allowing them to go. And it, it's very exciting conversations to have. So i would love to be part of that. I would love to do that. And it, what's, it, I keep hearing to say this. So Jules was so great when she felt like she was given the gift for having three months. She had a big lifetime celebration party. We planned together before she got really sick and she danced and spoke to over 350 people to say goodbye. And then she wow. went into hospice. And I remember we were sitting there one night having a drink and she, she looked at me and she's like, you know, that song leaving on a jet plane. That's how I feel. I feel like I'm just, I'm leaving on <laughs> and okay. I thought about that and I thought the lightness in that and I'm not taking away from all the people that suffer. I'm no, no. president of an organization that takes pictures of dying children for free to establish living records. I mean, I, I know I see the suffering in the world yeah. and it, yeah. it's a very different place that I'm speaking about. Um, no, and, and I, and I, I, I can tell you a, a quick thing from my mom that is so in alignment with what you're saying, which is that, um, maybe in the, in the, maybe it was a couple months before she, she left her body. Um, I was there and, and I, my dad was there and, you know, we were all still there and my dad was, was you know, we were clear that she was going to be going soon and, and my dad was saying something like, 
you know, well, I love you so much, and, and after after you're gone, um, you know, I will go to the cemetery every day, and I will bring flowers, and I will pray to you, and I will I will decorate, you know, I will make you. My father just really had that devotional side that, you know, I guess is part of where I got it from. And I know it's very romantic. I will just lay Aww. my body there, and I will give my... And my mother just stopped him, and she said... You're going to be going to a grave where there's a bunch of bones. She goes, I'm not going to be in that cemetery. She goes, I'm going to be with God. Oh. I think I'm just going to like lay there in that, in that. I never forget her saying this. She goes, I'm not going to be like laying there waiting for people to come and make offerings to me. I just go, God, I'm going to have other things to do. And, you know, he looked kind of shocked. And, you know, and I just remember seeing it going, oh, I just love you so much because that is how it goes. It's like, yes. you know, you drop the body and the soul is free and you go on to whatever the, the next, you know, assignments are. Right. And, you know, it was, I think she was a little ahead of my dad of knowing that, but it was, it was really beautiful. That and is. She said, you know, just, she said, just love me in your own heart. And, you know, don't bother going to the cemetery and crying because <laughs> I'm not going to, I won't be there. <laughs> I love it. That's so great. Okay, so yeah, it was even great about you. She's like, I don't need the most. Don't make the most expensive this and that. Very I hope you would be there. Um, okay, so I have a, another question. I have so many, and I, I, I actually like did a prayer before the call because I said. I have so many things I could talk to this woman, this beautiful soul about. I'm going to let the divine take the lead. <laughs> that's what I said. Yeah, that's and I and so, um, but we have such a, a large uh, following from the Middle East and young women that have just been through the revolution in Egypt. We have Syrian women that are going through the war there. And I, I wanted to ask you, all the principles you talk about with letting the divine take the lead, it's, it's, it's such a, a beautiful principle in the different things you talk about. How, do you, how would you apply that to those women that are experiencing external oppression more yeah. than the internal oppression that we have you know, in the Western world? Yeah, I know. I think it's, I think it's, it's, it's tricky because you don't want to, you don't want to trivialize anything happening, you know, really insane oppression. Right. That's, you know, in all kinds of places. I guess for me, the universal principle of it is that regardless of, how can I put this? Regardless of the outer condition, that the, that the outer karma is changed according, you know, to whatever right. you know, countries we're in. There's always this alignment that can happen that then within 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 whatever situation you find yourself, you do get shown the right action. Like that's basically how I see it. And so for one person, the right action might actually be to get very involved in a, in a very political, intensely political way. And for someone else, it's not. And for somebody else, it's to go make external change. For somebody else, it's clearly not. And so it's, you know, and I, and I think that, that that's the best I can describe how I see it because I even apply that here to people that, you know, some people are in very, very oppressive situations even within our own country. I agree. And yeah. hor horrifying. Mm -hmm. Horrifying. And I'll say, well, how do you apply all this? This just sounds very airy-fairy. I'm like, no, it's actually extremely pragmatic mm -hmm. because... First of all, I do think that the this invitation of the divine, this making the space, mm -hmm. makes it, it. You're basically creating the space. That in a way, you're saying whatever the highest evolutionary possibility is that can happen in this moment, allow it to happen. Right. So there's so many cases where something looks as if not, there's no way on earth that any change can come into this, and all of a sudden, there's a change. And I'll, I'll give you an example, it's, it's not from the Middle East, but uh, just to use something closer to home. Um, back when I was giving readings, I was giving them, there was this one woman, and she was in a really, really horrible, abusive marriage, mm -hmm. like seriously being beaten, whatever, had kids, couldn't get out, and 
no matter what advice she was getting, she remained stuck in this thing. And finally, we just started doing exactly this kind of stuff. Where, you know, even though she's supposedly in a culture that would, you know, allow to work and let her get out, she couldn't get out for financial reasons, family reasons, all kinds of stuff. And that invitation that really said, you know, just I had her do it for like 30 days. It, it, it you know, wasn't working to just do it once. You're changing really old mental patterns. Just calling in a miracle into this situation, you're taking the entire thing and you're saying, whatever is my role to play in this, whatever is the highest, the highest route that the divine wants for me, let me play that role. You, you're really giving up any sense of the personal um, doer. Right. And what came out of that, I mean, you know, I know we're, we're winding up our time, but basically, to make a very long story short, she ended up, you know, out, freed of the whole marriage, out of this, somebody gave her a, a safe place to go, she, you know, she ended up with her all, everything unfolded in this way that she could never have manipulated through her own mind, because her mind was like, there's no way, I'll never get out of this. There's no way. This is where I'm stuck. So I think it's, it's that kind of thing, it, it supersedes even the external find it because you start to get shown if there's actions to take they arise you get shown Absolutely, and I agree and doing some Skype calls with these a few Egyptian women I was blown away by the power the real authentic power these women feel inside and and the choice that they act it's almost like you know birth where you have something to push against yeah. the power that that they have and hold inside their their soul and that they have accessed compared to really 18 to 24 year olds i'm not distant 18 to 24 year olds in yeah, our society yeah, totally. it was like speaking to someone that was you know generally around 40 years old in america yeah. because they've accessed that authentic power through having some of the the strife that they've had in yeah. their lives it's it's fascinating to me to yeah to, and, and if you think about it you go because it is on one level it's all an, like an internal owning of that power. Right. Once that's access, there is a certain amount of it that can't be taken. No one can take it away. It doesn't matter what's going on. It yeah. To own, you, you own mm -hmm. it. You own it as your divine birthright. And, and I think that's kind of bringing it all back around. You know, my first question usually is how do you define authenticity in your life and your in your principles and we've been speaking about authenticity i feel like the entire conversation about oh, hold on. Your, your your voice is cutting out of it i don't know if you're hearing me I'll oh can, i can hear you that's better Thank you. um i i said my first question usually in all my interviews is and we never got to it because we've been talking about it the entire time the underlying definition of authenticity and authentic yes. power and if you could say a sentence or two about what you feel that is I mean well, I, I think and it's funny because I, I think I've, um, there's a really good story about it in Outrageous Openness where I'm talking about the um, there's, a, there's a spiritual group that reaches me as a writer towards the beginning of the book yep. and, they, and they say to me they kind of wanted me to, to do these sort of canned um, uh -huh. daily yes. uplifting quotes and you see a lot of that right. out there and I'm not trying to speak badly about it but you know they just want to write something like God is sunshine and it's all good and everything's <laughs> going to unfold perfectly and blah 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 and, and instead you know I wrote back the way I write which is pretty much just me right. and mm -hmm. told, you know, told a story or was sort of you know ironic and they wrote back and they were like no you know we can't use this stuff this, this isn't God and I was like this is God <laughs> Yes. So that to me is the essence of it, is that there's this, the, the divinity is so um, incredibly personal and unique. And in fact, it, I think it's why, you know, there's even some of the battles going on right now about things like marriage equality, it, it's, it's why I see that as a divine issue, that, you know, gay people should be able to marry, you know, I'm gay myself, that there's, God's making people in, in all these different ways that right. are so unique 
and so authentic mm -hmm. that as soon as you're saying this voice, whoever you are, is a unique personal voice that is an expression of God. It's not like, oh, if only you change and become a better daughter or a better wife or a better perfect devotee, mm -hmm. then you're an expression of the divine. No, you're an expression of the divine now. That to me is the authentic. And and that's such a beautiful place because that is what Women for One is all about. It truly is about women sharing these vignettes, kind of like you, you share your wisdom. You're sharing your wisdom through your authentic voice. That is God. That is the divine. Yeah. And, and I, do, I have to say, what I think you're doing is very radical and beautiful because, you know, for a long time, whether it was within traditional religion or even, you know, within a certain new age dogmatism or, or some spiritual dogmatism, there really were a lot of ideas of how, you know, how, how you should be the perfect little whatever. Mm -hmm. And it's very powerful what you're doing. Just start to go, wait a minute. It's, it's who you are as you is the conduit. Absolutely. It really, it, that's all there is. And that's what I love about these stories that are shared because it takes a lot of courage for women. I mean, it doesn't really actually, I thought it took a lot of courage and I believe that people believe it takes a lot of courage. Once you do it, it's, it's freeing. But well, I think it. to take and that and step. Again, even, even the change we prefer, courage. It's like, you know, I, I often think that because I really grew up as a quite a scared little kid. I mm -hmm. mean, I, I was scared of more things than I could count. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like I was this little, you know, dynamo. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it has been praying for divine courage mm. and, and saying, if you want me to do this, change me into somebody that can do it. Because by nature, there are all kinds of other parts that can arise, but I just go, those parts don't really matter. If the divine wants to use me, then give me the courage to be able to, to do this. And then eventually it sort of starts taking over. So I, I think even, even that topic, you don't have to think of it as being the ego's courage. Absolutely. And I think my last question to you is around, um, if you had a few words of advice or a phrase or a quote that you'd like to share with our community, what, what would that be? <laughs> I wish I had a copy of the book in front of me because it was, it was probably something straight from there. But, you know, it's actually the line that comes to mind for me. It, it, it was one that, I don't know why I just thought of this, but it, it was basically um, that the divine is a party and you're invited. <laughs> it was a, it was a, a, a quote that somehow was in the book, but it got left out. So I feel like that would be that would be a good one to give to everybody. It's like if there is this party and you've been invited all along and you haven't known that you could finally cash in your invitation. Here's your chance. Oh, the divine is a party. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you're invited. <laughs> And you're invited. The divine is a party, and you're invited. That is no so. Way, there's no way you have to dress, and there's, there's no special prayers you have to say, and you don't have to stand on your head for 40 minutes, and you know you don't have. It, it's like the art. You know, there's so much of that. It's all the rules and regulations that often, you know, to me in the end, what matters is can you make yourself empty and let the divine come through. That's what matters. All the rest of that are just things that. You know, that's great if you resonate with them, use them. If you don't, don't. But what matters is really whether you want to go to the divine's party or not. And uh, uh, that's so beautiful. And when we post this interview, I will have your book highlighted, um, Outrageous Openness, on the site on our homepage next to the audio interview. And That'd be great. And, you know, people might want to know that it's it's in the paper, but it's it's in, uh, there is an audio book version of it that a lot of people okay. uh, I'll, like, I'll, like I'll, to use, and there's a Kindle version, so people kind of find the version that works. Oh, we will put that it. all on there on the description then. And um, if anybody wants to join Tosha Silver's party, <laughs> they can go yeah. to toshasilver.com and yeah. look at her book, um, Outrageous Openness. And I cannot tell you, I could probably spend another 10 hours on the phone with you. I, I feel that too. Thank I you. you're really fabulous. I mean, you're, you're truly a kindred spirit. 
I, I, I thank you so much. I'm honored, and I hope to be speaking with you in the future about other I things. I would love to. I really, really would love to. You're great, and your organization is, is wonderful. Well, good luck, and thank you, Tosha, and I will uh, speak with you very soon, I'm sure. We'll okay. just surrender Take it up. <laughs> Thanks. Bye. Thank you.